Good morning, Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show, the good news and bad news about money. And we're here with Kim, but with a very special guest, long time, me, long time friend, 25 years now, is Dr. Chris Martinson. He's the author of The Crash Course. You know, Chris and I, um, who was that guy we met with? Uh, Richard Russell. Yeah. And he recommended talking to you. And then, so Chris came out with the crash course and he has now updated it. Now, the reason this is important, the update is important because the crash course is a book of prophecy. And Chris was warning us what's going to happen. Just like I wrote, I'm going to plug my own book here. This is called Prophecy. It's why the biggest stock market crash in history is still coming. And this book came out in 2013 because when the 2008 crash hit, that didn't fix the problem. It made it worse. So it was easy to predict why that, why the biggest crash was coming. And I think we're in it right now. That's why I have the balloon hanging back here. You know, it's from George Gavin. The balloon is the bubble that the Fed blew up, and the little gondola below it is you and me. So Chris's book, 20, I don't know how many years ago now, but we'll get find out. The crash course, let me give the metaphor, the picture he painted. He says it's like being in Yankee Stadium, this big athletic stadium, and you're taking an eye drop of water, eye drop of water, eye drop of water. And then all of a sudden, the infield, the pitcher's mound, you start saying, oh, it's wet. You know, but here's this huge stadium. Oh, the little, the little infield is wet. It doesn't make any difference. And the the original Crash Course book talks about how fast it goes from just a little wet to we're all wiped out. So that's why Chris's metaphor is very important. Do you remember that, Kim? I, I do. And and what I love about Chris is he's he's taking all these. There's so many factors and so many um, ingredients to this perfect storm, and he looks at each one of them, but all of a sudden it's like, you don't, it's like a deer in headlights. If you don't, if you don't know it's coming and all of a sudden, boom, it's upon you. Um, that's why, that's why we're going to talk to Chris today because he's up upgraded crash course. And uh, a lot has happened since that book originally came out. And I want to find out from Chris, what are, what do we need to pay attention to? What do we need to look at? Because this eyedropper in the stadium is filling up pretty, pretty quickly. Well, so, right now, I think the eye drop, the stadium, is the infield is just a little wet. <laughs> and then, so, Chris, uh, would Welcome you mind? Welcome to the show, Chris. Welcome. Yeah. Could you Thank take you. That meta, make that metaphor a little bit faster? Like, from the infield being a little wet from one drop, eye drop at a time, how fast does it take to fill? Well, sure. And, and Robert and Kim, it's so good to be back with you here. And, and we do. We go way back. Um, and, and it's been fruitful for all concerned, I trust, because I've learned so much from you over over time. And, <clears throat> you know, the crash course was ahead of its time. Um, I, 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 you know, but my motto is I'd rather be a year early than a day late when it comes to, you know, market crashes and big events. So I, there's a really big event coming. And it's it's really important that people understand what's happening. So the crash course talks about the three E's which is economy, energy, environment. And like you said, Kim, I do this at sort of a high enough level that we can see it, but not so far down in the weeds that you get paralyzed, you know, it's too much information, right? Just tell us how much information you need to make better decisions about where you invest, where you live, you know, all that stuff. But the honorary fourth E, Robert, is, is, um, is exponential growth, right? And, uh, you know, all guy mentioned math, you know, you can hear people tuning out, right? Oh, is this math, you know? But it's really important to understand this, thing called exponential growth because we're surrounded by it. It's everywhere. It dominates your life. And uh, it's it's not something we have to have math to really understand. And so the the way I help people embody this because, hey, we're humans, we think linearly, throw a fastball at us. And some, you know, some of us can calculate that and hit it. But you take the world's best batter and put them on ice and have them slip. And oops, that's a nonlinear thing. Like we all go down (laughs) awkwardly when we slip, right? Because we fall with a square function, like gravity um, is is not linear. And so, so, so how do well, we make sense of it? Not to interrupt you, would you mind explaining your eyedropper in Yankee Stadium? Sure. Metaphor? In the original crash course, and this is the updated version of the crash course, 20, let's, 
When did Crash Course first come out? Well, the video came out in 2008, but the book came out in 2011. Okay. And this is, this is coming at the updated is 2023. Right. So using the right. metaphor of the stadium, could you explain, first explain the metaphor of the eyedropper in the stadium so our viewers who haven't heard it can understand yeah. it? All right, so it's a thought experiment. It goes like this. <clears throat> so let's imagine I've got a magic eyedropper. And it's magic because if you hold out your hand and I put a drop of water in it, you have a drop. But it's magic because this drop of water is going to double every minute. All right, so after one minute, you have two drops. And after two minutes, you have four drops. And after about five minutes, you can fill up a thimble because it's just doubling and getting bigger and bigger. So the question is this, if we went to a big stadium, let's, the biggest stadium you've ever been in, hold 70,000 people, 100,000, whatever it is. And let's imagine two things. First, you get handcuffed to the highest row of bleacher seats. So there you are, you're, you're stuck, right? And this park is watertight. So we're going to do the second thing, which is we're going to put that magic drop down right on the pitcher's mound or in the center of the pitch at 12 o'clock. And so the question is, well, how long would you have to escape from your handcuffs, right? This water's gonna be filling up the stadium. And so when I ask this question, you know, um, whether it's to NASA engineers or whatever, usually, you know, people say things. Oh, this will be, you know, hours, days, weeks, years, everybody has an idea. But the answer is, if we start that at 12 o'clock, you have until 1250 to escape from your handcuffs. 50 minutes. 50 minutes. And by the way, if you think, oh, that Chris looks bad at estimating my park is twice as big as the one he possibly could imagine, then the answer for you would be 1251 because <laughs> it's doubling every minute, right? So if I got it half wrong, I was only off by a minute. So, but that's not the important question, Robert. You were getting at the important part, which is this, which is at what time is this park still 97% empty space, not filled with water, only 3% water, and how much time remains in the story? And the answer is at 1245, it's just 3% full. Hmm. The next five minutes, it goes from three to six to 12 to 25, you know, and boom, five, just five more minutes and we're done. So that's where we are in the story. We're surrounded by these exponential charts. Some of them are great, right? Technology's changing beautifully exponentially, but we're running out of oil exponentially and we're, you know, oh, using okay. up water so, and stuff, right? So please. I'm, my audiences are not your, your PhD. Our, our audiences are more following Kim and me. So the crash, this updated crash course yep. is saying, so it's 20 something years now, I think. Where are we in the stadium now? Uh, that, I would say the water's rushing up the steps right now. Okay. It's so clear where we are. So when I wrote the crash course, in 2008, when it came out in a video form, I said my catch line was the next 20 years are going to be completely unlike the last 20 years. So from 2008, that takes us to 2028. And I wasn't just being vague, you know, right. it's that I saw this. I saw a 20 year process of of hopefully us all as humans going, what do we have to do and how do we rally around and, and start making the right decisions? So so Chris, that didn't happen. What, so what are the factors that are this water is rushing up the steps right now? What are the factors that are causing this flood? Well, I, I look, look at, at it across those three E's, Kim. So economy, let's just look at the economy. Have you seen a debt or a deficit spending chart for the United States lately? It is a perfect exponential. This chart just goes whoosh like this. And the prediction is very easy. We're going to just create more and more and more debt. And we're just going to keep throwing it on and we'll call it money, but it's not. We're going to create more and more of this currency and we're just going to print like crazy because that's what we're going to do. But when you understand the relationship between money and money's not a real thing, it feels real, but it's not real. It's a marker. It's a claim. Money's good because we can buy houses with it, cars, you this know, is fake. <laughs> fake. This is real though. The yeah. silver stuff, right? You know, the, my, the land I, I own, that's real. Um, but we're making more and more and more and more money. And so you can, it's happening faster and faster. We always have a reason, right? There's always a reason. Oh, COVID. Oh, you know, Ukraine. Oh, the, there'll be a reason. But the reason is always the government prints more money and they have to print more and more and more. 
So as they do that, this thing, this exponential accumulation of money, at some point, that breaks and it breaks really badly. And when it does, people will go, wow, I, my portfolio got shredded. Wow, I got poor. Something happened, but they won't know what happened. But it's very easy to explain because we were making the claims, but we weren't making more of the real stuff. The claims don't mean anything unless you have real stuff that you can spend it on. The claims are useless unless you have a real economy. And instead of really creating more real economy, we've just been creating more and more claims, pretending that's good enough. And, and when you not. say real economy is because we're not producing anything anymore. Is that what you right. mean? To, to a point, yeah, we're not producing really anything. Um, and the problem is, is that to produce anything, Kim, takes energy. So then I wander people over to the energy story. And by the way, you're talking to one of the biggest energy bulls out there. I'm invested in oil wells, gas wells, you know, you name it, just like I know you guys are, because um, it's there's a whole story there. But when we look at anything, anything like here's a little remote control for some of the lights here. If you look at this, the plastic in it, the, the circuits, the little batteries, when you trace down any piece of this thing, it oil was involved in some way or natural gas. There was some form of energy because it didn't just show up magically, pass through some economic membrane and land in my lap. So when you look at where things come from, houses, cars, food, and you just scratch a little, there's energy. Okay, great. So we've admitted we need energy. And when you ask the question, take all the countries in the world, put them on a chart and ask the question, how much, how big is their economy? That's one part of the dot, one axis. And the other one is, how much oil were they burning that year? And it's a perfect line. You find that if you want to have a, an economy like the United States, where 5% of the world's population, we consume 25% of the world's daily oil, and we live in a very prosperous country. And there are all these people out there doing the ESG thing and green energy. And, you know, we have to like, you know, hamstring ourselves and not use fossil fuels. So they don't understand that our prosperity comes because we have access to energy and we use that energy. Right. I went, I went to school for <clears throat> I'm supply chain oil. I'm a t I drove tankers for standard oil. So we had to, at the academy, we had to study oil. And the message was energy drives civilization. You cut off energy, civilization dies. So when mm -hmm. Biden, that interesting character, I won't say anything because we get banned, when Biden cut off the Keystone XL pipeline, I think it was one of his first moves, I knew what he was mm -hmm. doing. He's going to bankrupt the middle class because every time that person is standing by their SUV pumping gas, it's, it's it's just sucking cash out of their pocket. And so we have inflation <clears throat> and then everybody raises their prices, you know. Like I went I went to the store when restaurant yesterday, I couldn't believe how expensive food is. And Kim and I have plenty of money. And all I can say is how does that average person making let's say a hundred K a year, how are they surviving? Do, do you know what I mean? And and uh, absolutely the, the food is driven by energy. And, you know, it's fertilizer, all that. You got to get trucks to get it to Safeway. It's just shocking what has happened. So that when Biden did that, he took, cut the Keystone XL pipeline off. Immediately, I knew, I said, he's going he's gonna to take down the middle class. Then he opens up the southern border. And, you know, Kim, Kim and I invest in oil in Louisiana and um, North Dakota and Texas, Oklahoma. We're selling oil for $30 a barrel. We don't invest in stocks. We invest in the oil well. We're selling oil for $30 a barrel, went to 130 I went, that's what they're doing. So mm -hmm. what, I'm, what I'm saying is, Chris, your crash course is coming true. The eyedropper is working a little too hard. <laughs> Yep. So and so yeah, it is. It is so um, it, with, the, with the energy and they and and you know all this talk of going to green energy and solar energy, everything green, 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 and we're banning gas stoves and all of this. What what in the <laughs> world is that going to lead to? I mean, how do we operate without poverty? It leads to poverty. It's exactly where it goes. Listen, I'm I'm going to install solar here at our house, but it's a it's a fringe thing. It, it's it's there to provide temporary you know backup in case. The grid goes down because we lose power here, you know, in 
in our town every so often. So it, but it has a role, but it's not the center role. And for people who are trying to move green energy into the center role, there's a whole conversation to be had, like simple conversation, like does enough lithium exist to make the batteries? Does enough copper exist? And the answer is no and no. And I could go down a dozen other things. It just doesn't even pencil out. It's like a, it's a non serious conversation and we have we should be having a serious conversation about this um you know and so that's just where we are and by the way speaking of what biden did with that keystone that was you know in the military they say once is an accident twice is a coincidence but three times is enemy action yeah he also drained our strategic petroleum reserve this is our core bank account that we should never be touching except in a dire emergency and it just got drained um, right. And so that's so, not helping us. The next thing he did, he abandoned Afghanistan. Yeah, he just. Yeah. In, mo- in a, it's kind he, of embarrassing. Yeah. Yeah. And the moment he did that, as you know, is that the um, Saudis joined Russia because of the petrodollar. And so this, you know, this is real money here. This is silver. But what Biden is doing, I'm not, I'm not doing political, although Trump's my good, our good friend. But what what but it's not what Biden's saying, it's what is he doing. Does that make sense to you? Yep. So I we always back. follow what people do. Yeah. So we come back, we'll be talking more about Chris. Once again, his updated ver- book is the updated version of the crash course. That magic eyedropper of yours has been working over time. And mm-hmm. I want to come back, we're gonna talk what can a person do? You know, if they don't have keys to the handcuff. What can they do? We'll be right back. If you're concerned about high inflation, looming recession, a stock market correction, or out of control spending in Washington, this is an important message to hear. Because the fact is, during every major crisis in U.S. history, many of those who failed to prepare watch their savings, investments, or retirement funds go down, while many with the foresight to own gold help preserve their purchasing power. Gold even made some folks richer. Now we're facing several major crises at once, and experts say we may soon face even more economic trouble. So please don't wait. Learn the simple way you can diversify with gold and put yourself on the road to financial peace of mind, even in uncertain times. The new free 2023 Gold Guide from our friends at Gold Alliance can show you how. Just visit www.freegoldguide.com slash Robert or call 1-800-473-4585. Republican governor and conservative commentator Mike Huckabee says Gold Alliance is the only gold provider he recommends to his friends and family. Find out why and visit freegoldguide.com slash Robert or call now at 1-800-473-4585. Feeling powerless over current events and your financial future? Financial freedom is your freedom. Robert Kiyosaki is the best-selling author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Over 40 million people have taken Robert's advice. Now it's your turn. Attend Robert's free virtual wealth building event. Claim your free access now at richdadfree.com. Don't wait, access is limited. Go to richdadfree.com. That's richdadfree.com. Welcome back, Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. And uh, here with Kim and our dear longtime friend, Dr. Chris Martinson. And he's talking about his updated version of his great book, The Crash Course. And we're talking or in the first part of this uh, podcast about how he was 20 years ago. He was talking about how he had a magic eyedropper and he, you drop one drop at a time filling up a place like Yankee Stadium. And he says that what happens is you don't know how fast it's going to hit you. You know, you see the infield a little wet and you go, oh, that doesn't bother me. And you're handcuffed to the top of the stadium. The question is, how much time do we have? Now, Chris wrote the original crash course something 20 years ago. And here's the updated version. And this little magic eyedropper has been working overtime. Any comments, Kim? Well, I think it's a perfect metaphor because I think there are so many people and I thank you people that are everybody that's watching this because there's so many people who have no clue, no idea what's coming at them. And all of a sudden they're going to be a deer in headlights. They're going to wake up and go, what happened? How did we get here? And what we're all trying to do is warn people that this is coming 
um, and so that they can prepare and do something. So that's why I really appreciate, Chris, your, your time and your being here and kind of giving us the, the warning signals and what to look for. So your your book, you've updated it. What what do we need to know? What are the what are the big changes yeah. and things you're seeing happening that is signaling this is this is coming quicker? Well, thanks uh, for that opportunity. And and this is the original book here, and um, the new one's coming out in in uh, March first. So to date it a little bit, but it you can pre order it now. And they tell us we're dangerously close to getting on the bestseller list. So I would love for people to buy a copy, if only to help us get on the bestseller list because then more people can hear about it. And I want more people to hear about it. And it's really important. I'm trying to save as many people as I can. It's kind of almost like we're at the lifeboat stage because that water's coming up, you know, if you you can't get out of your handcuffs, get a boat, you know? Um, So uh, the big things are this, we haven't made any serious plans for how we're going to control our deficit spending. We haven't made any serious plans for how we're going to navigate this new energy future, you know, Europe is a case study in this because it's a continent of 400 million people. It's energy poor. They got nasty brown coal. They kind of ran out of gas. Their oil wells are all kind of over the tip of, of their peaks. And they just got into a war with Russia by proxy. And, and so we're about to find out what happens when you starve a continent of 400 million people for energy. And it's simple. And, and- They're going to have less prosperity. That's what's about to come. They're about to have a huge decline in living standards over there. Right. But, you know, interesting was that back in the what the Weimar Republic in Germany, 1920s, they were taking yeah. wheelbarrows of money to buy a loaf of bread. And you were telling us just now during the break that what's happening in Europe today, they're stealing firewood. I mean, what's happening there? <laughs> yeah. So this past fall, when, you know, natural gas prices spiked by tenfold, Um, A cord of wood went from basically $200 to $2,000. And I have friends in Germany who said that they had firewood stolen off their porch. Like, who steals firewood? Well, when you get to the part of the story where energy gets really expensive, everything gets expensive because everything is a derivative of energy. So food gets more expensive. Obviously, your gasoline gets more expensive. Heating your house gets more expensive. Everything does because energy is at the base of that. So this is easy right now. I can't believe nobody's talking about this. Robert and Kim, fertilizer production. You need fertilizer to grow crops. In Europe, fertilizer production is down 70% from last year. And why is that? Because you need the natural gas to push into this thing called the Haber-Bosch process where we take nitrogen out of the atmosphere, combine it with natural gas, and we make ammonia-based fertilizers out of that. And then that's part of one of three fertilizers you have to put on your field. NPK nitrogen. So nitrogen makes plants grow and it just became too expensive. And the companies, you know, because we didn't have nobody understood, the government didn't quite get it. So they said, oh, we'll let the market sort it out. And the marketplace said, wow, they could, these manufacturers could not compete with fertilizer on the open market. So they stopped manufacturing it. So but that's- when we get to next year, you know what's going to happen? We're going to find out, oh, we needed that capacity because it's not like there was extra plant capacity somewhere. They just couldn't compete. So they shut it down and we're not going to have it. So next year, we're not going to have enough fertilizer. And the way we're going to notice that is the price of it's going to get really, really high. So and that'll be true everywhere. U- U.S. farmers will pay more. Everybody's going to pay more. Well, that's and what then we're going to pay more for food. The, exactly. The, they, they couldn't feed the people. The people rioted. But that's why one of the forecasts I see, you know, the the pessimists like me, they say starvation is coming. So I mm-hmm. tweeted, my solution is buy t- cans of tuna fish. You know, tuna <laughs> fish, this is about a year ago. I caught hell for it. You know, I, got, I almost got shadow banned for in recommending tuna fish. But I said tuna fish is a derivative of diesel, and diesel mm-hmm. fuel is higher than kite because you got to put diesel into a fishing boat. To, and so I said pretty soon, Instead of buying silver, you'd rather have cans of tuna fish. I got hammered for that one. <laughs> but I have lots of tuna well, fish cans. <laughs> and I'll tell people plant a garden, right? Um, you know, we really, this is, you, you know, when you say, okay, you know, if you're in Europe, what do you do? It's very clear to me, you have to begin thinking about how you're going to provide for yourself, right? How can I keep my house heated and cooled with less energy input? Maybe we insulate, replace windows. Everybody should have a garden because you're going to so want to 
So it's food and food and energy they've got to prepare for. That Absolutely. Just that's at, at the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. But you're also going to have to prepare, unfortunately, for social unrest, because when people get desperate, they do things right. If my kids are starving, I'm going to go find food for them. Right. It's it's just very normal. So I think people have to get ready for that. And the way you counter that part, you know, even if you live in a place where they don't allow you to have guns or something is, well, you better know your neighbors really, really well. And you better be very tight with them. And so making those social bonds always a good idea, but I think it's going to become something more than just, I want to have good social bonds. I might yep. need to have them. So it's uh, <laughs> it's part of the five G's to get prepared. You got to have yep. ground for food, gasoline for your car. Uh, what else? But gold. 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 <laughs> anyway, I've been preparing, you know, been preparing for years and it just sits there because when you need one, you got, you can't, you know, if you, somebody's breaking into your house, you can't call a liberal who knows Kung Fu. You know what I mean? They're, 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 they're going to, they're going to kill you now. So when, except, especially if they're hungry and I don't know if yeah. most people have experienced hunger, you know, once one of the trainings that the Marine Corps gave us is they starved us and what they, they threw us into the swamps in the winter of Florida with nothing to eat. And it took three days. We turned into animals. You know, we were mm. starving. There were seven guys in my my little squad, and they were tracking us down. They had guns shooting at us and all this. And they said, you're going to turn into an animal in three days. And we did. It's the most frightening thing is when you're hungry. I don't think you have any idea what logic is. It goes out the window. Mm -hmm. so. That's why they say... Uh, um, Civilization is only nine meals away from anarchy. <laughs> I'm about three meals away. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I have tuna fish. <laughs> so, Chris, you were talking about, you know, what people can do. So, you know, if you're in a city, you don't have land, you're in a, a condo or an apartment. What do you, what do you, how do you prepare for something like this? How does the average person well, who doesn't have access to land and gardening and all of that, what do they do? Well, uh, if I lived in a city, I would start making plans. I would figure out how I could make arrangements with somebody out outside of the city just in case, right? You should always have a plan B. Everybody should. If your plan A is everything's going to work out, you know, good luck with that. Um, but for, I get it, right? Not everybody can make those sorts of plans. Hey, so, hey, hey. well, you know what Jim Record says? If you live in a city like that, get a bicycle. Get a bicycle. <laughs> yeah because they want any gas because they can't pump gas. So yep. you, you can pedal your way out of the city. <laughs> All right, but I'm gonna put something on that bicycle though, which is really important that everybody needs to bring with them, which is, which is your skills. What do you know how to do? So I, I get this question, Kim, and people say, well, I'm young, I don't have a lot of capital, financial capital, I guess I'm screwed. I'm like, no, 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 you should learn how to do things because let's imagine a scenario it's gone Mad Max. We only have room in, in my compound for one more person. And two guys show up. Two guys show up with their families, right? One of them's got gold and silver. And the other one has none of that, but is a trauma surgeon and, you know, knows how to uh, raise bees. You know who's coming through that gate? Right? The guy, the guy and the gal, the, whoever has the skills. So skills are something that you can, you should, we live in an age where you can pick up your magic phone and you can start learning stuff right away. So, so to people who have a learning mindset, who are constantly advancing their skills, who take it beyond the thinking stage and actually use their hands, because you don't really know something because you read it. You know something because you read it and learned about it and then did it and right. failed and got better at it, you know? Um, so I, everybody can learn skills, right? You, what could you learn in an apartment? I don't know. You want to know how to brew craft beer? Do you want to figure out how to germinate seeds and propagate them and save them? All these things can be done inside um, with, but skills are going to be important because the number of people who actually know how to do things these days is uh, dwindling, unfortunately. And what, what the other thing my dentist I was talking to him about this, he's a prepper also. And he says, you need antibiotics, mm -hmm. you know, because they, they, you know, this whole thing that China supply chain antibiotic disappeared. So I traded him 45 bullets, you know, 45 ammunition for uh, a whole case of 45s for a whole bucket of antibiotics. He says, this antibiotics are going to be money pretty soon. 
So I traded in bullets for for uh, drugs. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's a fair trade, and this is actually a big point of concern because we just had a general out of the Air Force who runs the tanker resupply lines said in a memo that got leaked. It was in the Wall Street Journal saying that his bogey is that 2025 is when we get in a war with China. And you just mentioned something. You know, we get a lot of stuff from China that we no longer manufacture in the United States. And drugs is one of them, antibiotics, but a whole lot of other things. Can you imagine what happens to this country? Because we already know that there are shortages of like Ritalin for people with ADHD, like you can't get it. There's certain antibiotics that are no longer available here and people aren't talking about it. But to me, those are yellow caution flags. But if we got in a shooting war with China and they suddenly cut off the supply, can you imagine an entire country without its Prozac, without its, you know, benzos, without its whatevers, <laughs> right? Oh, All yeah. of a sudden, that yeah. is a hard cliff to go down. Well, fentanyl is going to be available. <laughs> hey, that, well, there's always that. Because <laughs> we have a border <laughs> that's not a border. <laughs> so you, getting back to Europe for just a second. So if is, are you saying what's happening in Europe is going to be happening here in the U.S. and happening all over the world? Yes. Yes, it will. And and part of the reason for this, there's a larger story. If I could, you know, bend somebody's ear for a couple hours, it would be to just take them through where we really are in the energy story. So when you look at oil, so oil is this magic substance and it's irreplaceable and nothing does what diesel does. So we like it. When you actually go talk to people in the oil business, you say, is it getting easier to find this stuff or harder? The answer is it's harder. We found the easy stuff. There's still plenty, but it's the harder stuff. But to get to the harder stuff requires an enormous amount of capital. And that hasn't been flowing in, not just this year, but for six years now, there's been this vast undercapitalization of the world. And it, I'm talking we're missing $2 trillion of investment that didn't happen. We're living on the wells we drilled a while ago, right. mostly. And, we, and so even if tomorrow if people said, yeah, forget about the ESG, we need that oil, let's get more, it's going to take years to get there, even if it's there to be found. So I'm just, we have this huge self -imp self-inflicted wound. The head of Saudi Aramco yesterday came out and said, ESG has killed investment in this business and we're going to, there's hell to pay. I've paraphrased, but that's, you know, this is, it's a big deal. So when you ask the question, what happens in an energy constrained world, there's only two answers. It shoots up really high in price or you fight for it. Right. Those are the two things that happen. And the other, this is, uh, we, we took this gold mine public, it's ODV, New York Stock Exchange. It's the richest gold mine in America. The reason I mention this is exactly as you're saying is because, oh, and this is our silver mine from Argentina. And we sold that Kim Brasilla to uh, Yamana. But what we know is the most expensive businesses are uh, gold and silver and oil. And, and that's why right now we're saying, you know, this is fake. Mm-hmm. And that's why what Chris is saying, you should save gold and silver right now. And the thing I like about this, as Kim and I know, is that um, it's money. It's money all over the world. You can go anywhere with gold and silver. And they say, welcome. You go with this stuff. They go, we don't know what its value is anymore because they're printing so much of it. Again, this going back to Chris's book, Crash Course, it's getting worse. The eyedropper is working overtime, and we're getting very, very close. I have one last question, which I think hopefully have the answer to. You know this uh, debt ceiling and all that, and they're yeah. What do you know? What's going on with that? I mean, they're trying to extend it or increase it, or what the heck are they doing? It's all theater, Robert. So. They're going, they, we've hit the bumped into the debt ceiling probably 20 times in 20 years. I mean, it's just, they will, they will raise it. Uh, I have no concerns about that. We'll breach it for a while, but you know, the treasury just stuffs invoices into desk drawers and raids things, uh, you know, in other areas of the government. So that, that, because if they, if they had a hard debt ceiling and that actually they had to live within, it would crash the treasury market because the U.S. government would default on its debt. If that happens, we, we're back to your five G's, right? Instantly. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. so yeah, if that happens, no, it won't happen. It, it'll all be theater. They'll pretend like it's a big deal. Surprise, they'll raise the debt ceiling again and carry on and keep printing because they don't know what else to do. We have, we have nobody, nobody in power right now seems to really care about what the future is going to be. And I hate saying it that way, but I'm, it's really how I see it at this point. 
And that's my final question because we're just about out of time. Why are they why are they allowing this to happen? Why is everything going to hell? Why who's what's the reasoning? I know it's a complicated one, but if you can just sum it up, why is all this happening? Because um good times create weak men. Is if you follow that that there's that hard times create good men, good men create good times, good times create weak men and weak men create hard times. Um our education system has failed us. People in power, they don't understand complicated things. You know, they, they, they it's just, um, it's just been enforced ignorance for too long. And, and so now it's just, it's all about ego, power, ideology, stuff that, that fundamentally nature doesn't care about. And I'm over here trying to yell like physics is going to have a say in what happens next, you know, and we don't have any good phys- physics people running the show anymore. So, so we just, we've lost, we've lost our way of where prosperity comes from. And it comes from real people taking real effort and real risk to create real improvements. So Tim, to your point, people say, what do we do? Hard, it's who you know, it's what you own. And I'm not talking fantasy digits, right? I'm talking real stuff and how well you know how to operate those things. We're, that, that's I think winners and losers. It's just another period of history. This time, there's relatively going to be more losers than winners to be on the winning side. It's what you know and what actions you've taken. And so it's it's getting down to fundamental time as far as I'm concerned. Anyway, Chris, thank you for all the years of friendship and wisdom and advice. And I recommend everybody get your updated version of Crash Course. I'm glad you can find some paper to get it printed. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Cutting down those trees so, for firewood now, not books. <laughs> trees, I love trees. Yeah, I got a whole story about I love trees. <laughs> I, I'm, I am a hardcore tree hugger, right, Kim? I'm almost planting trees. I love planting trees. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Final, final oh, question. Well. Final words, Kim? No, I, I thank you, Chris. This has been eye-opening, and I, I think the the final comment you just made on on what you can do and what you need to focus on. Um, I'm, I just so funny this morning. I signed up for a fishing course because I that I, I have a, a the house I have is on water, and I need to know how to fish. So I've signed a fishing course so I can catch fish and bring fish to people. <laughs> That's one of my skills I'm going to have. But to your point. Right. It, there's something everybody can learn and something everybody can contribute. And that's a great place to focus, I think, right now. So thank you for that. Exactly. Exactly. Well, thank you both. I, I always always enjoy talking with you and hope to see you in person again soon. Yeah. So, uh, so Chris, you know, keep that magic um, eyedropper under control. And everybody, <laughs> get you, everybody should get your new book, The Crash Course. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you thank all you. to the Rich Dad Radio Program. Bye.